Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our September Facebook Dutch case study. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. Today, we're talking about a postmenopausal woman who is on hormone replacement therapy, and she's complaining of hair loss, breast tenderness, anxiety, uh, even facial hair growth and fatigue. So this should be an interesting one. So my name is Dr. Roof. I used to be Dr. Head, and I still need to upgrade my Instagram account. Right now, it's under Dr. Kelly Head. That's where you can find me. But it will update to Dr. Kelly Roof. And I am a clinical consultant here for Precision Analytical. All right, let's dive right in. So I've named this patient Sally. And she's a woman in her 50s. Of course, she's got these androgen excess symptoms like hair loss and facial hair growth, which is just interesting, but also breast tenderness, um, some mood issues like anxiety and some sleep issues, fatigue during the day. Her BMI is 21. And remember the normal is between 18.5 and 24.9. I know it's not, you know, I know a BMI is not the best measurement but it can give us some information. So she's within a healthy weight and she's been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. So this is her hormone replacement therapy, her HRT. And I really love this case study because she's taking a lot of different hormones in a lot of different ways. So it provides for a really good discussion on HRT. So for example, she's taking 100 milligrams oral progesterone every night before bed, which is pretty typical dose. She's using an estradiol patch, a 0.05 milligram patch, um, which is a pretty typical dose. It's not a low dose. So a low estrogen patch dose would be like a 0.025 or a 0.037 patch. So she's doing um, kind of like a moderate dose. She is using a vaginal cream that has 10 milligrams of DHEA just a little on the higher side, dose-wise, and uh, one milligram estriol, which is a pretty typical dose. She's doing that every other day or every other night. And she's also use using the Vagifem, which is um, it's like a little insert. It's, it only has 10 micrograms of estradiol, which is a very, very low dose. So it usually only has these localized effects in the vaginal canal, it helps with vaginal dryness. It's such a small dose, those 10 micrograms, that we usually don't see that affecting systemic estradiol levels. And then she's using um, a topical facial estriol cream with eight milligrams. And that just seems like pretty high dose to me. All right, so she's taking some pharmaceutical prescriptions, you know, some Synthroid, which is T4, Cytomel, which is T3 for her thyroid, and also Naltrexone. Um, no supplements, so, you know, clean slate there. So this is her Dutch complete summary. Um, remember, all of these markers we're getting from the urine. And this is page one. So on page one, I want you to look kind of towards the left-hand side. And this is where we have the key to how to read the results. So remember that little purple band is the postmenopausal range. And then in between those two stars is the luteal range for like a, you know, a cycling woman. So we can automatically see that her estradiol, her E2, she's at 1.89. So she's above the postmenopausal range and into that lower luteal range. And that's because she's taking estradiol. Um, her progesterone, she's within those two stars. But remember with the Dutch test, we change the reference ranges when a woman is using oral progesterone to reflect what we typically see uh, in a woman who is taking 100 milligrams of oral progesterone, which that's exactly what she's taking. Um, one really interesting thing, I'm sure you saw it right when I flipped to this screen, her testosterone is really high. So if you see that testosterone dial in the red, that means it's high for any age. And remember, she's in her mid-50s, but this testosterone is even high for a 20-year-old. Um, below that, we can see her daily free cortisol pattern on the left, and we can tell automatically her cortisol is high. Remember, her result is the red line. 
And those solid black lines are the upper and lower reference ranges for free cortisol. So she's got some, some higher cortisol in circulation. So we'll talk about all these markers in more detail. Starting right now. All right, so this is page three of her Dutch complete. And you'll notice we have the progesterone dials on the upper right-hand corner, the estrogen dials below that, including the estrogen metabolism patterns. And then we have the androgens on the left-hand side. So let's focus on her progesterone. Um, remember I said when a woman's taking oral progesterone, we change the reference ranges to reflect what we typically see in a woman who's taking that typical dose of 100 milligrams each night. And that's because, you know, when you take a hormone orally, it goes through first pass metabolism in the gut and the liver. So the majority of that oral progesterone, like 90% of it gets metabolized into these progesterone metabolites right away in the gut and the liver. And a lot of them spill over into the urine. So what we see are really high levels of the progesterone metabolites in the urine that don't necessarily reflect circulating progesterone levels. And so if we didn't change the reference ranges, most women who are taking oral progesterone, their dials would be above range in the red, and we didn't want practitioners to freak out and think, oh my gosh, my, my patient is on way too much progesterone. Because uh, it's not necessarily true. When a woman's taking oral progesterone, there's not a good test out there to monitor circulating levels of progesterone. So we tend to change the dose of the oral progesterone based off of her symptoms and then the clinical research around um, protecting that endometrial lining from hyperplasia if a woman has uterus and she's also taking estrogen. So here we can see her overall progesterone, which is the top, very top dial, it's within range. It's what's, you know, what we typically see for a woman taking 100 milligrams. It might be kind of normal low. But what we can use the Dutch test for is to see how she's metabolizing her progesterone. So what I do is I look at the dials. I don't look at the numbers, but I look at the dials of the beta pregnenolone and the alpha pregnenolone, And I look at the direction those dials are pointing. And you'll notice her beta pregnenolone dial is pointing higher than her alpha pregnenolone dial. And this is significant because it's the alpha progesterone metabolites. It's that alpha pregnenolone that crosses the blood brain barrier and acts on the GABA receptors in the brain. So it's really the alpha progesterone metabolites that help women with their sleep, that help women with their mood, their anxiety, their irritability. And remember our patient, she's still suffering with anxiety, sleep issues, fatigue. So since she's not pushing down her alpha pathway as much, and that could be genetic, I might actually increase her progesterone dose so that she gets more of those alpha metabolites. And that's why women take oral progesterone before bed because it makes them groggy. You know, it's acting on their GABA receptors. So I might increase the progesterone dose so it might help with her anxiety and her sleep. Um, I might add on other GABA support before bed. So I might give GABA or L-theanine or passionflower, valerian, relora. There's a lot of different options there. All right. So this is kind of what I was just talking about. The alpha progesterone metabolites act on the GABA receptors in the brain. So it's very, um, it's a good route of administration. You know, the oral progesterone will make more progesterone metabolites than a topical application or a vaginal op application. So if you want help with sleep and anxiety, the oral route might be the way to go. This is a paper by Dr. Doreen Saltil. Uh, I highly recommend reading it. It's actually on our website. If you look at the very bottom of this slide, I have included the, um, the, the web address where you can read it. But Dr. Doreen Saltil, she wrote this paper called Transdermal Estradiol's Use in Menopause, an Evidence-Based Affirmation. And what I love about this paper is she does talk about using progesterone to protect the uterus 
from endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. And she goes into the research. She's really done a deep dive into the research to see what the research says. And you'll see, let's see, it's the second bolded point on this slide. Prometrium, which is oral micronized, oral micronized progesterone. So 200 milligrams, either continuous, so every night, or sequential, so 12 to 14 days in a row every month, with the standard dose 0 0.05 milligram patch is proven to prevent endometrial cancer. So remember our patient here, she has a 0 0.05 patch, but she's only taking 100 milligrams of progesterone. So that's another reason why I might increase the progesterone to 200 milligrams, just to protect her uterus from that hyperplasia and possibly cancer. All right, so one really interesting thing here, do you see her estriol? It's really, really high. So remember it's in the red, so it's above range and she's at 179.5. So she's way above the luteal range. Um, she's very, very high. And, you know, it makes sense that she's high. She's using a high dose estriol cream on her face. She's using vaginal estriol. Uh, she has the estradiol patch which some of the estradiol converts to estriol. And the interesting thing is some of the estriol can convert over to the 16-OHE1. And remember the 16-OHE1, that's a phase one estrogen metabolite and it's a proliferative estrogen. So it can make breast tenderness worse. So it's possible, I'm not saying this is 100% what's happening, but remember she has breast tenderness. It's possible that all of that estriol you know, some of it in, in and of itself, but also converting to the 16 oh one might be contributing to some of that breast tenderness. So I might do a trial of lowering the estriol just to see what happens with her breast tenderness. Um, so with her HRT, I just kind of highlighted everything that can elevate estriol. And we talked about a lot of this, but you know, even the vaginal DHEA, the 10 milligrams, that is a kind of higher dose. So it can affect systemic hormone levels. And some of that DHEA can convert to testosterone. Some of it can convert to estrogens and estriol. All right, so if we look at her estradiol, it's in the lower end of the luteal range. She's at 1.89. And remember the postmenopausal range is 0.2 to 0.7. So she's above the postmenopausal range and into that, that lower luteal range. And these are the things that can contribute to her estradiol levels. Of course, the estradiol patch that she's wearing, um, but also that vaginal DHEA. Remember, some of that can aromatize and convert over to estrogen. And remember, our androgens aromatize, they convert to estrogen. And we know that being overweight, blood sugar issues, inflammation, a high stress lifestyle that can all elevate or increase aromatase activity. So I keep that in mind. So going back to Dr. Doreen Saltiel's paper, uh, I just thought this was really interesting. You know, when it comes to estradiol and vaginal atrophy, um, the research has shown that even low dose patches of estradiol are effective for that vaginal atrophy, the vaginal dryness. Also, bone mineral density, even a 0.025 patch has been shown to help with bone mineral density, which is pretty cool. Um, and hot flashes, even a low dose patch, estradiol, has been shown to help with hot flashes. So we don't necessarily need to have high estrogen levels to improve these symptoms and these clinical outcomes. Of course, for some women, they are going to require a higher dose estrogen to help with those symptoms or bone mineral density. But what we tend to do is try to use the lowest amount of estrogen to get the clinical outcomes that we're desiring. Um, our president, Mark Newman, he wrote this paper and it's titled Transdermal Estradiol, a Critical Review of the Literature and Available Data. This is a really good resource too. And there's the website where you can read this article. But, you know, he says again, low dose estradiol patch can help with bone mineral density, the hot flashes or the vasomotor symptoms and the vaginal atrophy, the, the vaginal dryness.
Um, he also mentions in his paper that a lot of practitioners will try to aim to get the estradiol between 0.7 and 1.8, so above the postmenopausal range and up into up to the, the lower end of the luteal range um, to help with these clinical outcomes, you know, to improve hot flashes, for example. And in the serum, the equivalent might be around 20 to 60. I feel like in the serum, a lot of people are aiming for about 40 or 50. And on the Dutch test, a lot of people are aiming to get that urine estradiol around 1.8. All right, so if we look at her estrogen metabolism patterns, remember those three arrows that are coming out from estrone are pointing to her phase one estrogen metabolites. And we talked about how that 16-OH can be a proliferative estrogen. But remember the 4-OHE1, that's the one we worry about becoming a reactive quinone causing DNA damage and increasing risk for breast cancer. So I'm very happy to see that her 4-OH percentage is nice and low in that pie chart. It's 6.8%. We want it below 11%. And I'm also happy that her 4-OH dial, where it says 0.29, I'm happy that this is within the postmenopausal range. You know, it's, it's just low, it's nice and low. She does have some poor methylation activity in phase one, at least on this day. So you could consider supporting methylation. And when you support methylation, that will help clear out that 4-OH metabolite because the 4-OH has to get methylated in order to be moved from phase one, where it's unstable, to phase two, where it's stable and ready for excretion. All right, let's look at her androgens because this is <laughs> really interesting. Um, this is still on page three. We have these age-dependent reference ranges. I kind of blew it up so it's larger so we can see it. And I highlighted her age range. Remember, she's in her mid-50s. And we can see, for example, her DHEAS, so her storage form of DHEA, is normal low for her age. And then her downstream DHEA metabolites, the etioclanolone and the androsterone, are kind of you know, normal low. So DHEA overall, her markers are kind of normal low. But then look at that testosterone, it's so high. So why? So testosterone, I mean, testosterone can be this elevated for a few different reasons. Um, number one, it could be contamination of the urine sample paper. So let's pretend she has a partner who uses testosterone cream. And let's pretend, you know, it's nighttime, he was putting on his testosterone cream, and then he saw her urine strip, and he was like, oh, let me move that thing over here. So he had the testosterone cream on his fingers, then he touched her urine sample paper, contaminated it. So we might see high testosterone on her Dutch test. Um, another example is, let's say she has a partner who uses testosterone cream. And then they cuddle, or they hug, or they share a towel. And let's say that testosterone cream gets on her. And we have seen this where women, postmenopausal women, they start having hair loss and facial hair growth and acne. And they're like, what's going on? They do a Dutch test and their testosterone comes up really high like this. And then we discover, oh, their partner started using testosterone cream. Um, if the testosterone cream gets on their skin and into their body, usually what we see is the downstream androgen metabolites elevate also. Because of course, if you have more testosterone in your body, you're gonna have more testosterone that's being pushed down into these other androgen metabolites. So on page two, there's a few androgen metabolites that are listed on page two, but not on page three. So always look on page two. And, you know, her 5-alpha DHT, this is her most potent androgen. Uh, it's the one that if it gets too high, you can get acne, you can get the hair loss, the facial hair growth. Remember, she's having hair loss and facial hair. And her DHT, it's within range, it's 4.1. It might be a little robust for what I typically see for her age, but still within range. Her 5-alpha androstenedial, which is downstream of DHT, is within range. And we're finding that the 5-alpha androstenedial 
this marker might be a better reflection of alpha activity in the cells than even the 5-alpha DHT itself. And that's because the 5-alpha DHT, it's a peripheral hormone. It likes to hang out in the tissues. So sometimes the levels of 5-alpha DHT can be higher in the tissues than what we see in the serum or the urine. So always, you know, look at that 5-alpha androstenedial. Hers is within range. It looks good. And her 5-beta androstenedial, which is another downstream androgen of testosterone, is actually below range. The, the epitestosterone can sometimes tell you a little bit about if someone is being exposed to testosterone or not. Because usually, for example, um, let me, let me, so epitestosterone and testosterone, they're epimers of each other. They're like mirror images. Epitestosterone doesn't really do anything in the body, but we measure it to double check our testosterone levels. And so testosterone and epitestosterone, they're mirror, mirror images. They're made roughly at the same rate. And so usually their levels will be similar. But let's say she is getting testosterone cream on her skin from her partner. Um, what happens is that testosterone has a negative feedback on the brain. So the brain is like, wow, there's plenty of testosterone. Uh, we don't need to make as much on our own. So what happens is the endogenous, you know, her body's own production of testosterone drops off. And so does that epitestosterone. So this could be a clue that she's being exposed to testosterone, um, that that testosterone is actually in her body. But I keep in mind that epitestosterone levels, they do tend to drop off in menopause. So this low epitestosterone just could be a menopausal thing. So it's still unclear why she has high testosterone. So there are a lot of benefits of androgens. Remember, they're gonna help are, are usually help with our hair, <laughs> our skin, um, our libido, our muscle strength, our mood, our ability to lose weight. You know, they help with our lipid profile, cardiovascular system. But if androgens are too high, you can start getting some of these symptoms like acne or facial hair growth or scalp hair loss. And I highlighted the ones that she's experiencing. So what are some other reasons why androgens elevate? This is not an extensive list, but it lists a, a few things. So, you know, the ovaries could be making a lot of androgens. The adrenals could be making a lot of androgens. Uh, with stress, you know, if you're really stressed out, usually it's the adrenals overproducing androgens. Um, if you're overweight, you know, 50% of our testosterone is made in the fat tissue. It gets converted from androstenedione. So that can tend to elevate androgens. Uh, insulin issues, you see that with PCOS. Insulin issues can cause those ovaries to overproduce androgens. A low sex hormone binding globulin. And then of course, you know, thyroid issues, PCOS, um, the non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and the HRT transference or supplementation, which I'm kind of suspecting is going on here. Uh, lastly, if she can't clear out her androgens well, if her liver and her gut are not functioning well, you know, you'll have higher androgens in circulation. So I love this diagram. I just threw it in here so that you can take a picture or a snapshot. This is for a younger cycling woman. For a, a, a normal, healthy, younger cycling woman, this is where her androgens come from. And you'll notice the adrenals make the majority of her androgens. In menopause, you know, that con contribution from the ovaries really drops off. A lot of it comes from the adrenals. So why are her androgens elevated? You know, maybe stress. She's got a lot of anxiety. She does have some high cortisol. Um, but maybe, you know, what I think it could be is maybe she's got a partner who's using testosterone cream. So I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so the only thing she's taking hormone-wise that could elevate her testosterone is this vaginal DHEA. The 10 milligrams, it is on the higher side, but I wouldn't expect it to ele elevate her testosterone that much. Um, that testosterone is pretty high. And, you know, if it was elevating the testosterone that much, I would expect it to elevate the etiocalanolone and the androsterone also, which are downstream metabolites of DHEA. 
So I'm not convinced it's her vaginal DHEA elevating that testosterone. So one thing about sex hormone binding globulin, I just wanted to say, uh, you know how it binds up testosterone? And if it's low, you can have more testosterone in the free form or the bioavailable form. And the testosterone that we're measuring on the Dutch test is more of a bioavailable testosterone. So you could always look at sex hormone binding globulin in the serum to see if it's low. But even if it was low, if she had normal total testosterone, I wouldn't expect that free testosterone to be that high. Okay, so here's some further workup. You can see I highlighted the total testosterone, the free testosterone, estradiol levels, and sex hormone binding globulin. I'm, I'm going to confirm this in the serum. I'm going to talk to her first about possible contamination from someone else who's using testosterone or even like a caretaker who's using testosterone. Or if she goes to the gym, sometimes people are using the testosterone cream and then they go to the gym and they work out. And then you go over to the gym equipment because they didn't wipe it down. Um, and you're wearing a little tank top, you know, and then you sit up against the gym equipment. I think it's good to cover up because it's kind of kind of gross anyways. But, um, you know, then you could get testosterone through just contact with the gym equipment. It's happened. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to double check that. But I'm also going to look at her blood sugars, her inflammatory markers like the SED and the ESR, her thyroid panel. Uh, you know, because there could be other reasons for the higher testosterone. So I kind of want to do a little more research. So let's look at her adrenal panel. Here it is. It's on page five of her Dutch complete. Remember, all of this data comes from the urine for a Dutch complete. Her metabolized cortisol, she's at 3,089, which is within range, a little on the low side. This can tell you total adrenal output. It's basically all of the freed uh, cortisol and cortisone that was metabolized and cleared out of the body. So the body was like, okay, I'm done with this cortisol. I'm going to metabolize it. I'm going to clear it out, put it in the urine, and that's where we test it. So we didn't find a ton of these cortisol metabolites, but we what we did find a ton of is free cortisol and free cortisone. So we also measure, measure the free cortisol and free cortisone in the urine, and we found a lot of it. So she's keeping her cortisol in circulation. She's not clearing it out very well. She's not metabolizing it very well. And with this type of pattern, you can see this in like just any, anything that creates a state of low metabolism. So hypothyroidism. That's why I want to do a thyroid panel to double check the thyroid medication she's on. Um, suboptimal liver function and low calorie intake. But we can tell she's not clearing out her cortisol well. That's part of the problem. But she also has high cortisol in circulation. So the brain still feels like she needs high cortisol in circulation. If the brain didn't feel like she needed high cortisol, it would just lower the ACTH signal to the adrenals. And then she'd have low cortisol in circulation or normal. And she'd have normal or low metabolized cortisol but the brain is still trying to keep that cortisol high in circulation for a reason. It could be her anxiety. That's possible. But here's a list of other things that can lead to high cortisol in circulation, including pain, inflammation, you know, blood sugar issues, intense exercise, you know, if she did an intense workout that morning, infection, et cetera. So I think hers could be anxiety and she's not clearing her cortisol out well. Um, on her organic acids page, she's got a lot of low values. <laughs> so her glutathione marker is low, her dopamine metabolite's low, her norepinephrine, epinephrine, you know, adrenaline metabolite is low, this melatonin is low. You know, all of these require amino acids to be made. So I always, when I see all of these low in a row, I ask about protein intake. And then I also contemplate, well, if they're eating enough protein, are they digesting it? How's their stomach acid? You know, the older we get, our stomach acid tends to drop off. Uh, when we're really stressed out, our stomach acid tends to drop off. So sometimes I'll supplement with a little betaine HCL with meals, if appropriate. But um, yeah, that protein intake is important. 
digesting that protein is important. And as, at least for the dopamine and the ad adrenaline metabolites, um, you know, adrenal support, gut support can be helpful. Foundational support is B vitamins, vitamin C. All right, so let's talk about some treatment considerations. So of course, this is the further workup we're gonna do, which we already talked about. So if her serum testosterone levels come back within range or even low, then the elevated testosterone on her Dutch test could be due to actual contamination of the urine sample. So that goes back to where her partner put that testosterone cream on and then touched her urine sample paper and moved it out of the way. If that's the case, then the only marker on the Dutch test that's falsely elevated is the testosterone. And if that's the case, then I might make these changes with her hormone replacement therapy. So this is if her testosterone is actually normal or low. So I might increase that 100 milligrams oral progesterone to 200 milligrams. I know I talked about this before, but there's some research that with a 0.05 patch, which remember is a moderate dose, it's not a low dose patch. So with a 0.05 estradiol patch, the 200 milligrams oral progesterone might offer better protection for her uterus against that endometrial hyperplasia and cancer than the 100 milligrams oral progesterone. Um, you know that oral progesterone, it's gonna create a lot of those progesterone metabolites that are acting on the GABA receptors. So improving or increasing her dose might actually give her more GABA support, might help with the anxiety, might help her feel a little gro more groggy before bed, you know, help her sleep during the night. And if she's sleeping better, her fatigue might get better and it might improve the breast tenderness. You know, if the breast tenderness is coming from maybe higher estrogen, you know, than her body is used to, there is a possibility that increasing the progesterone can make the breast tenderness worse though. That can be a side effect. Sometimes if women just continue to take the oral progesterone for another week or two, that breast tenderness subsides as their body gets used to the elevated progesterone. So I'm gonna have her continue that 0.05 milligram patch. Remember she was around like 1.89 with her urine estradiol, which when it comes to bone density, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, I'm usually aiming for about 1.8. So I thought that was pretty ideal. Um, I might decrease the vaginal DHA just cause it, it's on the higher side and it might help with the hair loss. It might help with the facial hair growth or maybe even the breast tenderness. It, it's possible. So I might do kind of a trial and say, well, you know, maybe you don't need that much vaginal DHA. Let's cut it in half and let's see if any of these things improve. Of course, if, if her partner is actually using testosterone cream and then they're hugging or sharing a towel and that testosterone is actually getting into her body, then just avoiding, avoiding her partner during the times when uh, that partner is applying the testosterone cream, uh, or just being better about not getting that contamination could also really help with the hair growth, the facial hair, facial hair growth, the hair loss, the breast tenderness. Um, I'm going to decrease her estriol. Remember her estriol was super elevated and her 16-OH-E1 was kind of getting into the lower luteal range. And that 16-OH-E1 estrogen can be more of a proliferative estrogen and might, might contribute to the breast tenderness. So a lot of, there's a lot of research that lower dose estriol can help with vaginal dryness. A really common dose is one milligram of estriol in a vaginal application, but we might not really need that much. And sometimes a 0.5 milligrams is sufficient. So I might decrease the estriol to 0.5 milligrams and then um, maybe stop the Vagifem. I mean, she's got a lot on board for vaginal dryness. She's got the DHA and she's got the vaginal estriol. She might not need this extra estradiol. So I'm, I'm always a fan of trying to lower the amount of hormones that someone's using, um, you know, make it a little easier for them so they don't have to do all of this stuff 
every single week. And then of course, she was using a really high estriol cream on her face. And a lot of women will, you will use this. It's almost like an anti-aging cream. It can help with wrinkles, for example. There's some research that a 0.3% estriol cream can help with, uh, let's see, elasticity, firmness, wrinkles. And so this is more, you know, 0.3 solution is three milligrams per gram. Usually women apply about a gram. So I'm going to lower her estriol from eight milligrams to three milligrams. Hopefully that should be okay. But, you know, lowering that overall estriol might be helpful for her body because we can tell all that estriol she's putting on her face, her body's absorbing it. It's coming out in her urine. Okay, so if we discover that she's being exposed to that testosterone, so her partner's applying it and then they're hugging or they're sharing a towel, then remo removing that exposure could really help with those high androgen symptoms because it'll likely lower her testosterone. So it could improve her hair loss, her facial hair, even her mood. Remember, she has a lot of anxiety. Um, that could be from higher testosterone. And when you, when you lower the testosterone, then there's less testosterone to convert to estrogen. So that could help with breast tenderness to some extent. So some supplements that I might add on, I might wanna support methylation. Remember supporting methylation will support phase two of estrogen detox. It'll help move those 4-OH metabolites out of phase one over to phase two where they're more stable and ready for excretion. And so, um, you know, I might use like a B-complex with TMG, trimethylglycine, also called betaine, not the same as betaine HCL, that's mostly hydrochloric acid, but in supplements, it'll say TMG, trimethylglycine, betaine, or betaine anhydrous. And um, TMG helps to convert with homocysteine to methionine. So it kind of does the same thing that the B12 and the folate do, just another way to attack it. Um, I might add on some magnesium. Magnesium is a cofactor for the methylation cycle. And then optimize choline in the diet. Remember, choline converts to trimethylglycine. So I like to optimize the TMG and the choline. And most women, like 94% of women, are not getting enough choline in their diet. Because uh, the major sources are egg yolks and animal liver. And I don't think I know anyone who eats animal liver on a weekly basis. So to support the adrenals and the anxiety, I might use ashwagandha. I usually tend to do about a gram a day. I like to space it out right when they wake up, early afternoon, and before they go to bed. The ashwagandha can be calming for some people. You know, the oral progesterone, increasing that can really help with the anxiety. Removing any sort of, you know, testosterone transference from her partner could be helpful. The magnesium before bed can really be helpful for anxiety too. Uh, I might try to optimize that cortisol clearance, you know, making sure her liver is well supported, her thyroid is well supported, and she's getting adequate calories and not skipping meals. Um, of course, you can, uh, you can consider other calming support during the day like holy basil tea. Some people do holy basil uh, yeah, in a tea form. And when they steep the tea, they keep a plate over the top to keep the essential oils in the tea. But passion flower, valerian, remember valerian, like 10% of the population has the opposite effect. It's a little more stimulatory for them. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Uh, magnolia, lemon balm, L-theanine, rolora, GABA, those are all going to be very calming. So overall, you know, I'm going to treat the causes. I'm going to wait that blood work result so we get a little bit more information. But we're going to do the higher dose progesterone. Stick with the estradiol patch, same dose. Lower the vaginal estriol and DHEA. Lower the topical estriol. Support her methylation with a B-complex and a trimethylglycine. Support methylation and anxiety and sleep with that magnesium before bed. Um, support her fatigue, her adrenals, her anxiety with that ashwagandha and optimize the choline, which is going to help support that methylation. But remember, rats who get 
rats who are deficient in choline get fatty liver. So choline in general is going to support the liver. And that's about it. But we're definitely going to have that conversation with her. Does she know anyone who's using testosterone in a topical cream or a gel? Because it could be exposing her. All right, that concludes our case. Um, thank you for listening. Of course, if you have any questions at all, you can email us at info at dutchtest.com. But I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I hope it was helpful. And yeah, have a great, have a great day.